international aid agencies in the Central African Republic suspend operations in three towns amid escalating violence. Good news in the war on HIV AIDS. And a surge in exports makes an American classic the best-selling sports car on the planet. Africa 54 starts right now. Good evening and welcome. I'm Vincent McCorry. This is Africa 54. We begin in East Africa. The United Nations says South Sudan is no longer classified as being in famine, but the country continues to face severe hunger as the unrest that has forced three million people out of their homes continues. Lafon County, in the eastern equatorial region, has not seen the same levels of violence as other parts, but communities there are experiencing extreme hunger after drought ruined crops in the field that are traditionally grown here like sorghum. Now the food shortage has affected children the most. Uh, some children have had to, schools in fact have had to close because students are too hungry to attend classes. Food security issues and low salaries have seen some teachers quit their jobs in that area. Volunteers have had to step in to help kids uh, keep the students in school. Italy intends to deploy several ships in Libyan waters by the end of August to fight human trafficking and stem a flood of immigrants, a government source said on Thursday. A mission plan should be brought to the cabinet for approval by Friday, and the necessary parliamentary vote to endorse it may be held next week. Now, the official said if the Italian parliament approves, the mission might begin by the end of August and that he, the Navy can actually be ready to put it in place in a matter of hours. Prime Minister Paolo Gentiloni met with Libyan military chiefs and ministers on Thursday to discuss security, immigration and the Libyan situation. He had said on Wednesday that Libya's UN-backed government in Tripoli had invited Italian warships into its territory waters. Tripoli had refused access to its waters to the European Union's anti-trafficking ship mission Sophia since 2015, weakening efforts to stop smugglers. As a result, some 600,000 migrants have reached Italy by sea from North Africa since 2014. Most came through Libya, where people smugglers operate with impunity. Also, the international aid agencies in the Central African Republic have suspended operations in three towns due to escalating violence between armed factions and attacks on aid workers. Now, the United Nations has warned that the latest violence could plunge the country back into a humanitarian crisis. The conflict first erupted four years ago when Muslim Salika rebels seized power, triggering reprisals by Christian anti balaka militias. Fighting has erupted in several hotspots in the northern and eastern parts of the country. Despite a peace deal signed last month and last year's election of President Faustin Ashan's uh, Tordere, which raised hopes of reconciliation. The withdrawal of aid and services in Bangasu, Kaga, Bandoro and Zamio has left thousands of people without food and health care. Now, for more on the situation in the CR, reporter Zach Badoff joins me by phone from Bangui. Zach, uh, welcome to Africa 54. Thank you. Now, first, give us a, a sense of how things uh, look like in the country, because for a while we weren't really hearing about violence. What's going on at this moment? Yeah, you're right. There was a period of calm. Things were doing uh, all right here. But since May, in this series of attacks in the southeast in particular, in a city called Bangasu, and there have been nearly attacks every week. Uh, the situation is really deteriorating, both on the security front and also on the humanitarian things as well. Um, again, since May, there have been about 130,000 recently displaced people and at least 300 people have been killed in violence between uh, various factions. And I should emphasize that it's not necessarily a, a religious conflict, of course. It's mostly about various armed groups who want to take control, although it is along religious lines. So you have times you have a anti blocka working with uh, ex blocka to take control of some strategic point. Uh, but what this means, however, is that the civilians are the ones caught in the middle, they're the ones who are bearing the brunt of this crisis that is really continuing and is, is making it more and more difficult to be brought to the people. 
the countryside. And we apologize for the poor line there, but Zach, in terms of uh, control of uh, uh, the country, does the government that is currently in power have any capacity to provide security to the citizens? So the Central African Republic Army is roughly 7,000 troops. Most of them are in Bangui. There's roughly three to 400 of them deployed into the countryside. The police and the gendarme are also totally deployed in the countryside. So the countryside is on the world. And, and the parts that are, where there are security forces are the UN peacekeepers. They are about 12,000 throughout the country. It's not enough. Uh, you know, they have their special forces to put out hot spots when there are attacks here and there. But really, the, the people are stuck in a situation where um, there are all sorts of attacks coming up on um, groups. And again, for the ones who are about to suffer, and, 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 and the, the security presence is just not strong enough. There is a new training mission to train up Central African forces. And it's going to take many, many years, maybe five to ten, before they can seriously deploy. So it's, it, it's a really tough situation, and it's really something that's just going to take years until the situation improves. While we'll be watching developments there, Zach, thank you very much. That's uh, Zach Badoff reporting from the Central African Republic. Not too far from there, Rwanda's presidential hopefuls are rallying supporters ahead of next week's election. Incumbent uh, President Paul Kagame, who has been in power since 2000, is seeking a third term in office. If he wins, he can legally remain in power until 2034, following a 2015 referendum to extend term limits. Kagame is credited for restoring stability after Rwanda's 1994 genocide, presiding over rapid economic growth and a relatively corruption-free government. The rights activists say those achievements have come at a, an expense of civil liberties. Some of Kagame's political opponents have been killed after fleeing abroad in cases that remain unresolved. Kagame faces opposition candidate Frank Habineza of the Democratic Green Party of Rwanda and independent candidate Philippe Paimana, both of whom have promised democratic reforms. Seven Nigerian governors are in London tonight visiting President Mohamed Buhari. The Nigerian president is receiving medical treatment there for an undisclosed condition. Now, according to Reuters news agency, a convoy of three vehicles was seen arriving at the Nigerian embassy in West London. Buhari has been abroad twice this year for health reasons. His first trip lasting nearly two months. He left Abuja in May, handing over power to his deputy, Yemi Osunbanjo, to allay fears of vo a void at the helm of Africa's largest economy. Earlier this week, the presidency said Buhari would return to his office duties, official duties rather, as soon as doctors advise he can end his medical leave. As Vice President Mike Pence prepares to visit Montenegro and hold talks with Western Balkan leaders in August, a senior State Department official says U.S. engagement in the region remains strong. This is being welcomed by those countries' leaders amid concerns that deep cuts in the proposed budget for the State Department could diminish Washington's role in these fragile democracies exposed to Russian interference. VOA's Keda Kostrechi reports. The U.S. views an allegedly Russia-funded coup to assassinate Montenegro's prime minister and topple its government last October as the most egregious example of Russian interference in the Balkans. It says it will defend its own interests and those of its allies in the region. Other countries in the Balkans need to be very cautious, um, need to watch very carefully what Russia is doing, and that's what we're doing as well. Vice President Mike Pence has lately been the face of the Trump administration's engagement with the Balkans, meeting with Serbia's newly elected president, Aleksandr Vucic, in Washington last week. Next week, Pence goes to Montenegro. Like the previous administration, they've delegated the Balkans to the vice president, which is not all bad, but it's not all good either. Um, it, it seems to me that it's doubtful. No. That, uh, that there'll be a great deal more attention, but I don't think we know yet. Russia has sought to deter Balkan countries from inching closer to Euro-Atlantic institutions. Yi says Balkan integration with the EU and NATO is in the U.S. interest. And that's why U.S. policy 
has been consistent across numerous administrations, both Democrat and Republican, and I believe that's going to continue. He says the more committed the Balkan countries are to following through with reforms and fighting corruption, the less vulnerable they will be to outside influences. And a signal of commitment from the United States could go a long way in a region with internal and external challenges still unmet. Keira Kostrezi, VOA News. Well, I want to know what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we covered. Join the conversation on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We're also streaming our show live on Facebook. So check us out and share our show with your friends. And check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com. Find me on Twitter at VOA Vince McCory. Now coming up, are the scales tipping in the fight against HIV and AIDS? Stay with us. This is Bizbeat. It's probably not much fun being a cow unless you live on this Wisconsin farm. But the deep, soft bedding of sand creates an environment where cows can rest half the day. Nigel Cook is the director of the Dairyland Initiative, a University of Wisconsin program promoting, through workshops, the good treatment of cows, which also makes them more profitable. Mitch Brewing is with Mystic Valley Dairy. If you take away their stress, they actually produce more milk. These cows enjoy misting sprays. Fans supply soft breezes. And yes, these cows, they get back rubs. Brewing says his cows live longer, they have fewer injuries, and actually eat less, but milk production on his farm is up two gallons a day for each cow from using the techniques from the Dairyland Initiative. Industry where 10 cents can make a huge difference. For VOA's Bisbee, I'm Philip Alexio. Well, joining us now is Africa 54 health correspondent, Lino Madu. Well, what do you have for us today, Lino? Well, a new report by the United Nations says AIDS-related deaths have nearly halved since 2005, and more than half of all those with HIV now have access to treatment. The new report, Ending AIDS, Progress Towards the 1990-90 Targets, gives a detailed analysis of progress and challenges encountered since the initiatives launched in 2014 towards achieving the 1990-90 targets by its December 2020 deadline. Among other things, the report reveals that record 19.5 million people with HIV are accessing life-saving treatment up from just 7.7 .7 million in 2010. However, despite such progress, only 43% of children living with HIV have access to antiretroviral therapy compared to 54% of adults. Peter Gies is Director of Strategic Information and Evaluation Department with UNAIDS. So we're calling that uh, efforts there be stepped up so that uh, treatment for children can be uh, catching up to the treatment levels of adults. We also see that there is a specific issues for men and boys because men are less likely to know their status and start treatment than women. Uh, less than half of men living with HIV are accessing uh, antiretroviral treatment and men also are more likely to die of AIDS-related illnesses than women. And according to UNAIDS, seven countries have already achieved the 1990-90 targets, including Botswana, Cambodia, Sweden, and the United Kingdom. Now, there are some scientific progress in the quest to win the war against the human immunodeficiency virus, HIV, that causes AIDS. But experts gathered this week at the Paris Conference on the Disease say proposed cuts in global funding may delay the final blow. VOA's George Putich reports. It took three decades from the appearance of the first drug for slowing the onset of AIDS to today's drug cocktails that save many of the infected patients from what was inevitable death. The conference on AIDS, held this week in Paris, reflected optimism about new treatments and concern about proposed cuts in funding, especially by the U.S. government. 
Mais je veux rappeler qu'il manque aujourd'hui... I want to remind you that $7 billion per year is still missing in the fight against AIDS in the world. This is the money we need to find. And thanks to our mobilization, we could assign it to the fight against AIDS. In spite of the latest advances, the virus that causes AIDS remains a formidable enemy due to its unprecedented ability to develop resistance to drugs. New medicines keep it under control, but they are neither available nor affordable for many. Experts also suspect a large number of unreported cases. We know we're treating um, 19 and a half million people, but there's another 17 odd million who need treatment today. And we haven't found those people. Many of them are in regions of the world such as West Africa, Central Africa, Eastern Europe. Central Asia that we haven't just haven't got to. So that's very concerning. However, the conference heard many optimistic notes. We are reaching the people in need. We are saving lives because it's not only about proving that we can put people under treatment, but also that we needed to completely change the screening. Among the highlights is the recent news about the 10-year-old South African child born with HIV. After only a year of treatment, the child has been virus-free for more than eight years. Citing other similar cases, as well as the promising vaccines being developed, experts say the scales may finally be tipped against the disease that so far has killed about 35 million people. George Putic, VOA News, Washington. And that's all for our health report for today. So stay in touch for more. Find me on Twitter at Linor Moudou. Vincent? Well, thank you very much, Linor, for joining us today. And be sure to watch uh, for Linor Moudou every Tuesday and Thursday for the latest health news in Africa, right here on Africa 54. Now, the UN says women's and children's health is improving faster than at any point in history. A massive program has saved countless lives and is gaining momentum. The U.S. Carol Pearson has our report. More women are surviving childbirth and more children are surviving childhood, even in the poorest of nations. It's the result of a U.N.-backed initiative called Every Woman, Every Child. Launched in 2010, it brings together more than 800 organizations including the World Health Organization. More women are receiving uh, services of, of care, skilled care during birth, um, more uh, antenatal care, more postpartum care. Uh, children are receiving more in, uh, vaccines than ever before. Governments and private organizations invested more than $45 billion dollars to improve women's survival during pregnancy and childbirth. The funding helped train midwives, improve nutrition for women, children, and adolescents. It provided education, better sanitation, and clean water. The result? Since 1990, the world's maternal death rate has fallen by 44 percent. Another achievement, death rates of children under five declined by more than 50 percent. Together, they are great humanitarian achievements. It also makes sense economically. Governments save money that is normally spent fighting disease. And healthy people contribute more to a country's wealth. The return on investment is high. Every kind of investment from, uh, on women, children, adolescents is, is an immense uh, resource for uh, the countries and, and their J uh, GDP. Nearly all preventable deaths among women, children and adolescents occur in low to middle income countries. In 2015, more than 300,000 women died during pregnancy and childbirth. Most deaths could have been prevented. Also that year, nearly six million children under age five died, mainly from avoidable causes. That's 16,000 children dying every day. The goal now, is to improve on the program's success. Carol Pearson, VOA News, Washington. Well, and uh, it's time now for a short break. Still to come on Africa 54, a classic American muscle car tops global sports cars sales. We'll be right back.
we hope for now, because we hope for a developed Liberia where everybody will be able. Welcome back to Africa 54, and here's what's trending. Facebook, uh, Facebook's mobile advertising business grew by more than 50% in the second quarter as the social network continued to establish itself as a venue of choice for an ever-growing array of online advertisers. The social network, which now has more than 2 billion regular users, has been squeezing more ads into its news feed while adding more ads to its photo-sharing app, Instagram, which has more than 700 million users. Chief Executive Mark Zuckerberg said the company was turning attention to monetizing its two messaging services, Messenger and WhatsApp, which have more than 1 billion users each. Next up, Amazon.com has launched its two-hour delivery service in Singapore, marking the e-commerce giant uh, push into Southeast Asia and its first head-on battle with its Chinese rival Alibaba Group Holding. While Amazon deliveries, uh, delivers to Singapore higher-end services such as Prime services, which include access to the company's video streaming service, were not available. In Asia, Amazon has largely sidestepped China and focused on India. But its arrival in Singapore, a tiny but wealthy English-speaking city state of just over 5 million people, has been uh, hotly anticipated as a gateway to a Southeast Asian region of 600 million currently dominated by Alibaba. And finally, Adoration and O run deep for the Mustang, one of America's most iconic muscle cars, attracting fans from all corners. Now another fan base is growing on the other side of the globe. More than 50 years after it was introduced, Mustangs are galloping their way across China to the world's largest auto market. Booming international sales mean the Ford Mustang is now the number one sports car in the world, surpassing the Porsche 911, BMW 4 Series and the Chevy Camaro. Ford sold more than 150,000 Mustangs last year, clinching the top sales rank for the first time. Ford plans to ship the cars to more than 140 countries this year. And that is what is trending today. Well, Egyptian cyclist Helmi Al Said broke the Guinness World Record for the fastest cycle across Europe whilst uh, raising money for children with autism. An experienced cyclist and endurance athlete, Al Said trained day and night for over a year, often cycling 100 kilometers a day. In record breaking time, 27 year old Al Said and a team of four other Swedish cyclists cycled over 6,000 kilometers across Europe in May, from Ufa in Russia to Cabo de Roca in Portugal. The team uh, fastest Europe traveled through Russia, Belarus, Poland, Czech Republic, Germany, France, Spain, and Portugal. They took 29 days, 5 hours, and 25 minutes to complete their journey, breaking the previous record by over 12 hours. All donations and reward money were donated to the foundation. Now, women have always been an essential component of Hollywood as lead actresses in the romance genre, in comedy and drama. But women have found it difficult to establish themselves in roles traditionally claimed by men in the film industry, such as filmmakers and leads of superhero films. This summer, though, that ceiling has finally been broken by talented women. VOA's Penelope Polo has more. Wonder Woman, starring mesmerizing actress Gal Gadot and filmmaker Patty Jenkins, have broken the box office record for a female director. I care about making the greatest Wonder Woman of all time because I love Wonder Woman and I'm a filmmaker. So the, that, nothing's ever going to make that more interesting to me. So the fact that I'm a woman or she's a woman or we're all women or whatever was a wonderful deep part of it. But it also ha you just tune it out completely because I'm just a filmmaker trying to make a film that I care about that much anyway. Jenkins's Wonder Woman is the best depiction of Princess Diana of Themyscira so far because it combines impressive high action sequences with a great story arc about Wonder Woman's journey leaving her utopian world to go to the war front during World War II to fight and defeat evil. Jenkins' superheroine model combines power and grace. Being a hero is often not 
a proactive state of being of going and punching somebody out and therefore things being over, it ends up being so much more on an everyday scale about understanding and love and forgiveness and the complexity of life. Next to this great woman is brave pilot Steve Trevor, interpreted by Chris Pine. I am so lucky um, that Patty was the one to direct me. Her vision for Diana was in line with mine. The dynamic duo of Gal Gadot and Patty Jenkins is more proof that Hollywood studios can entrust big budget productions to women. And they are not the only ones. Filmmaker Sofia Coppola recently received the coveted Palme d'Or for Best Director at Cannes Film Festival for her remake period drama, The Beguiled. Amy, help! What happened? The original movie is from the a male point of view, the soldier's point of view of this woman's world. And I thought oh, it would be so interesting to go back and find the book and tell the same premise, but from the women characters' point of view. The film offers poetic cinematography and an all-star female cast. Nicole Kidman and Kirsten Dunst play the lead roles as teachers in charge of an upper-class boarding school for women fending for themselves during the United States Civil War. Their orderly life is disrupted by a handsome, injured Union soldier seeking refuge at the school, sowing discord and jealousy among the women. Sofia Coppola is only the second woman to win Best Director at Cannes in 71 years, and though many would argue she has an advantage in the industry coming from the Coppola filmmaking dynasty, her talent is undeniable. Still only 4% of women directed, um, I think, the major motion pictures of 2016. Wonder Woman's box office triumph and the Beguiled's artistic recognition are opening the door for more female auteurs in mainstream Hollywood. Penelope Pulu, VOA News, Washington. Well, and that's our show for today. Now, be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com. For more news, tune in to VOA's evening radio show, Africa News Tonight at 1800 UTC. And in the mornings today, break Africa between 0300 and 0600 UTC, Monday through Friday. Thanks a lot for watching from all of us in Washington. Have a good night. To English in a minute. When something loses its original shape or form, it does not look very natural or comfortable. Bent out of shape. Hey, um, did you tell Greg about my dinner party? Yeah, I did. I thought he was invited. Well, now he's all bent out of shape because I didn't invite him. I'm sorry. <laughs>